Okay, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you today's presenter, Keith Keating. With a career spanning over 20 years in learning and development, Keith is currently pursuing his doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania's Chief Learning Officer Program and has experience in a myriad of areas ranging from instructional design, leadership coaching, performance improvement, and process transformation. More recently, Keith has been leading clients on the design, development, and execution of their global learning strategies. At the the role, problem solving is at the heart of everything that Keith does. He studied design thinking at MIT's Sloan School of Management and found design thinking was the perfect tool to add to his problem solving toolkit. Since then, Keith has been utilizing design thinking to help clients tap into understanding and resolving unmet customer needs. So, Keith, thank you very much for joining us today, and I'd like to hand the session over to you. Perfect. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are connecting from. So thank you for joining. For those of you who came back, thanks for returning. We'll be talking today about the application of design thinking. Uh, the way that I'm going to go through today's session is really to split it up into two groups. So first, we're just going to do a quick recap of what design thinking is for those newcomers who may not be familiar with the topic. But the rest of the session is going to be split up. The first half will be a deeper dive into the five phases of design thinking, and I'll be talking about the best practices within those five phases uh, from my practical experience. Then we'll stop for a Q&A, and then we'll continue with a detailed design thinking use case study from an initiative that I led uh, last year with the global automotive manufacturer. And we'll walk through those five phases of that use case and how we apply design thinking, as well as talk about the outcome. And then we'll stop for a second Q&A. So with that, we're going to go ahead and jump in. So just to level set, what is design thinking? It's a set of principles for creative problem solving. It's a methodology that asks us to take a step back from the problem in front of us and think about the person on the other end of that problem to make sure that we're solving for them, which helps lead to human-centered products, services, and internal processes. And one of the great values of design thinking is that it helps to unlock the needs and the problems of our users even when they don't know what they are. It helps us get to that root cause analysis, which is often a challenge that we face in learning and development, really trying to understand what is the problem that our clients, our business partners, our learners are telling us, what's the root cause of that problem? And design thinking can help us get there. If there's anything to remember, design thinking is a focus on the people. There are five stages or phases within design thinking empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And empathy is where you learn about the audience. Define is where you're defining the problem statements based on what you've learned from your audience, from your learners. Then once we have the problem statement identified, we move into brainstorming. Then we create representations of those ideas. And then, of course, we test those ideas and we gain user feedback. And when you look at this, it looks like it's linear, but it's actually nonlinear and it's iterative. You're failing fast, you're trying again. Each one of these phases could be working consecutively together. Just depends on your individual project, but it is nonlinear and it's iterative. And one last quick reminder, design thinking is part of a larger family, that human-centered design family where we're focusing on the human, on our learners, on our end, end users. And there are six families within human-centered design but specifically in L&D, we narrow it down one layer below this where we have the phrase learner-centric design. And that's the area where we're focusing on our learners. And within that family, you have design thinking, learner experience, and user experience. So just wanted to share design thinking as part of that bigger human-centric design family and learner-centric design family. So that's a quick recap for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with the concept of design thinking. But now we're going to jump in to those five phases, and I'm going to talk about them in more detail with a lot of best practices around the phases. So the first, of course, is empathy, where we're learning about our audience. We're understanding our audience. 
And empathy, that's, that's the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing, putting yourself in their shoes, wearing their hats. And the empathy phase is probably the most important phase within design thinking because that is where you are opening the door for communication with that end user. You're learning about their challenges. And there's a lot of work that needs to go into that empathy phase before you even address your learners. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today because it is critical to put in the effort to really make sure you and your team are prepared before talking to your end users. And it helps us uncover the voice of the customer, but it also helps to remove our bias. We often have these preconceived notions or we have our experience that we're bringing forward with us to the challenges, to our learners, to our customers. And oftentimes that can include bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And the empathy phase helps us get through our own individual bias. So there are three approaches within the empathy phase. Try, where you are immersing yourself in the experience of others, where you're figuratively wearing their hats, you're getting their hands on the products, you're trying the learning, the maybe the LMS, you're trying the technology, you're putting yourself in their shoes to experience exactly what they're experiencing. The next is where you're just observing. You're taking a step back and you're looking at how are your users interacting with each other? How are they interacting with the product if you're using this from a product perspective? Um, how do they work together in their space? What's their environment like? You're just observing to see what it is that you can learn from just watching. And then there's engaging, and that's where we're asking our learners, our end users, more information to understand from their perspective what they say they do, what they say they feel. And this happens in their own environment, so that they're in that comfortable space and so they'll be more open and willing to share that information with you. Now, I want to talk a bit about some guiding principles for the empathy phase. The most important is that we want to assume a beginner's mindset. When we are starting our design thinking initiative or we are learning about our audience, as I mentioned, we have these preconceived notions. We have this this bias that we're bringing forth. And oftentimes, we may think we already have the answer because that's what people usually rely on us as the learning and development experts is to bring forth our expertise. But sometimes being an expert means being quiet and listening. And that's the key for the empathy phase. We are just listening. And the best way to do that is to assume a beginner's mindset. Whereas you might think you know the answer, but you really don't. And we want to be pushing that aside right now so that we're listening as if we're hearing this for the first time, as if we're truly interested in wanting to learn what this end user has to tell us. And so we want to assume that beginner's mindset. Guiding principles that sit within that. First of all, we're not there to judge. We're not there to make decisions. We're just there to be listening to what they have to say, what they have to tell us. And to do that, we want to question everything. Again, even if we think we understand what they're telling us, question it, drill down, help uncover. Because often it's part of human nature when we're having a conversation, when we're being asked a question, that first response may not be the whole story. It's just the first layer, and we're there to peel back multiple layers so that we can get to that root cause analysis. And to do that, you need to be truly curious. You need to care because the person that you're talking with, that you're interviewing, they'll know if you are truly curious about what they're having to say, and they'll also know if you're not. And to demonstrate that you are truly curious, that's where you're going to be questioning everything that they're saying to help drill down. We'll talk more about the questions associated and the approach for that in a few minutes. You want to look for patterns in what they're sharing with you so that you can help to group those in more logical and concise uh, groups. And again, really listen to what they have to say. So these are some guiding principles on empathy, but before 
you even start to engage with your learners. There are a couple of other things to understand. So first is the mechanics of an empathy interview. So the interviews, when you're talking with your audience, it is not a focus group. You don't want to have multiple people in the same room because you're going to have uh, personalities that dominate. You're going to have other people who are quiet and are, are following maybe what somebody else is saying. You want to be focusing on one end user at a time so that you can truly give them your attention and give them the space and the freedom to be who they are, to share with you in the manner that they want to share with you. Now, in that room with you, um, what I recommend is that there's usually three people. There is your end user, there is your interviewer, and there's a note taker. And this is important because when your end user is giving you their time and they're trusting you with that time that you're going to be respectful and that you're going to be prepared and that you're going to listen, to truly listen, you can't be focusing on trying to take notes. So the best methodology is to have somebody who is a note taker, and that is their only role, is to be capturing everything that's being said within that room so that you can truly stay focused on that end user. Now, from the note taking perspective and from the, the mechanics of the empathy interview, it's also recommended not to have two males conducting the interview or the discussion. I'm not really keen on the word interview, although that is truly what it is. It really needs to be more of a conversation. Uh, so there is an idea that um, if there are two men in the room, meaning there is a, a male who is an interviewer and a male who is a note taker, the other person, whether it is male or female, may feel uncomfortable. So we recommend that it is two females, an interviewer and the note taker, or it is a male and a female, but you want to try and avoid two males. Um, from the note taking perspective, if from a budgetary constraint issue you can't have someone in there taking notes, then try and be creative. Um, open up a conference line and have someone on the phone be taking notes. If, you, if that's not an option, uh, make sure that you have the approval from the interviewee or the, the end user and you could record the session with an audio device as long as they de you delete it afterwards and you make sure that um, it's not being saved and that you do have their approval and there are no legal constraints. The best recommendation also for the interview is to be face-to-face. -face. That way you can truly make a connection with them. You can see the body language. You can see the shifts and the little nuances. If that is truly not an option, then you could do a video conference. But it really is the best um, option to be in there face-to-face -face so you could truly make that connection with them. When you're asking the interview questions in the empathy phase, they are open-ended, they're non-leading, and they're probing. And I'm going to talk a bit more in a few minutes about some examples of these type of questions that you should be asking, but also that you should be avoiding. When you are conducting the interview itself, there is a, what we call the anatomy of the interview. Normally, I schedule the interviews for one hour, and I use 45 minutes of that time to be conducting the interview, and I leave the last 15 minutes for a debrief between myself and the note taker to make sure we're aligned with what we heard, with what we felt, um, maybe adjustments that we want to make to the questions or to the next interview or maybe things that we learned from this because it's important for the interviewer to also be giving input um, with that note taker. So for the interview itself, again, usually it's about 45 minutes. It's in a comfortable space for that end user, that interviewee, so it's in their environment. Uh, it's preferably a quiet space, you're in a conference room, you're in an area by yourself where you're not being interrupted, where people aren't going to walk in. I've had managers often ask to sit in the interviews, and that takes a little bit of coaching, but I try to get them to understand that this is really a one-on-one -on -one time with me or whoever is the, the interviewer and that end user where we can really focus on each other and the conversation. When um, managers are um, 
quite against that idea and they want to be in that room, that's, uh, you know, you have to deal with those situations as they come. And that has happened before. And what I do find, of course, is that end user is uncomfortable and they're not going to be open and honest. So I'll look for maybe scheduling a, a follow-up call with them. Um, you have to really determine each situation. But the best practice is to just have um, no managers in there, no other colleagues in there. And so for the interview itself, you're going to start by introducing yourself, introducing the project. You build up a bit of rapport. Talk about their day, how long they've been with that job, what they do. Uh, you could talk a little bit about yourself there in that rapport section, but that's really where you end talking about yourself. The rule of thumb, this is really 80% listening and 20% us talking, and us talking means that we're just asking questions. We're not providing input. We're not responding to what they're saying other than asking more questions to get them to really evoke more storytelling. And that's what we want to try and get out of this is not just answering questions, but getting them to talk about that situation, talk about their experience, and tell those stories around the theme of your design thinking initiative. And using your own questions to really explore their emotions and dig down, again, getting to that root cause analysis, asking those five whys to really get under what that challenge is and what they're truly trying to share with us. And then as we're closing off, uh, I'll provide any follow-up questions or statements based on what I've learned from them, what they've talked about. And of course, we have the thank you and a little bit of a, the wrap-up section. So that's a high-level overview of the anatomy um, of that 45-minute interview. Now, before we actually get into the room with our end users, there's a significant amount of time that needs to be given to prepare for the interview. And this is important because, as I mentioned earlier, they're putting their trust in us that when they're giving us their time, we are truly prepared. And so we need to be prepared. I would say on average, I spend about maybe a day or two, depending on the, how big the initiative is, depending on how big my team is, brains, uh, preparing for the interview. So the first thing that we do is we brainstorm the questions. We think about what is the theme for our design thinking initiative? What is it that we're trying to uncover? And we just get together and we brainstorm all the questions that come to mind. We'll then start to identify and order themes of our questions. We'll group them together because you want to have a cohesive thought process, a cohesive um, storytelling interview. You don't want to be throwing out random questions during the interview that are, are really taking that end user all over the place. You want to make sure that there's a theme and those questions are really grouped together in those themes. So after we've got our groups, we've ordered the themes, then it's time to refine the questions and go through and make sure that they're open-ended, that they're not leading, that we try and avoid the yes or no questions because when you use yes or no questions, most likely you're going to get just the answer yes or no. And that's not what we want. We really want to be drilling down and getting stories so that we can learn more about that end user, about the situation, their environment. And then once we've got our questions refined, then we want to create what I call the interview protocol. And that's a bit of an a interview script that everyone will use. Now, you don't have to follow the script verbatim, but you want to make sure that um, however many interviewees er, er, interviewers you have going out, that it's the same anatomy. It's the same protocol and process. Uh, so that the opening is everyone has a clear understanding of how to introduce themselves, introduce the initiative, so that they recognize the grouping of the questions, they know how to close out the session, the interview. And so I create a script that people can follow to give them a bit of guidance um, during that interview process. Now, the most important part of preparing for the interview after you've completed these four stages is actually going out and practicing these, doing a dry run with your team. As I was learning design thinking and understood the concepts of the empathy interview, immediately I thought, that's, that's no problem. I just get my questions and I go out and I ask. 
And I learned the hard way that that is not the best approach because once you're asking the questions, once you're in that environment, you realize a little bit more about the reality of those questions and how the interviewee or end user is responding to them. And so it's really great practice to go out and rehearse them. And so I'll often just in the office uh, ask people, hey, can I talk with you for a few minutes? And I'll go through the actual interview protocol with them and just see how they respond, see if they are truly open-ended questions and if they're really evoking those discussions and those conversations. So definitely want to have a practice or dry run with those interviews. Now, once you've practiced, once your team is comfortable, and now you're actually conducting the interviews, there are a number of best practices to consider. So the first is, of course, you want to be taking copious amounts of notes. You're not just taking, the, the note taker is not just taking notes on what's being said, but you're taking notes on the environment itself, what you see, what you hear, what you feel. You're taking notes on the experience you had from the minute you arrived until the minute you leave. I have learned a lot about environments, about companies, about the way that the teams work together by what I observed outside of the interviews, by what I experienced from the minute I walked in, whether or not somebody greeted me, whether or not it was a team environment where people were working together or was everyone isolated and it was more of um, an independent type activity, what type of signs are on the walls? Um, I actually learned a lot from one specific company where they had a lot of negative signage in the bathrooms, ironically. I remember there was a sign on the mirror that said something like, if I find out who's throwing the towel paper on the floor, you're fired. And it wasn't a joke. And so that helps me understand a bit more about that environment and why that environment had such a high turnover rate because it was actually a hostile environment to be working in. So taking notes like that are really important to help you craft the bigger picture of the situation that your end users may be in. You're there to understand, not to validate. And this is a very important distinction because often when we are putting together a design thinking initiative, our customers or even ourselves, we may come at it that, hey, I have this, I have this idea that I want to validate. This is what I think is the issue. So I'm going to go out and validate that. When you do that, you are approaching it from a very myopic viewpoint, and you are shutting the door to learn about the larger picture or the larger challenge or the root cause of what may be uh, driving that issue that you're thinking about. So we are not there to validate. We are there to understand. We want to be encouraging stories and following tangents that that interviewee may be sharing with us. And again, you want to be avoiding those yes or no questions because when you ask those, you're really shutting the door. You're going to get just a yes or no answer, and that's not really telling us the story. Now, you can't always avoid them 100% of the time, but the rule of thumb is try to avoid them for the most part. Pay attention to nonverbal cues. Uh, you know, when somebody sits back or folds their arms or you see them shutting down, take note of that so you can adjust your questioning and maybe even remove that question in the future um, if you're not getting the type of answers that you're looking for. Don't be afraid of silence. Often, when we ask a question, people need time to think about this. Um, these interviews can be a little bit emotional. This may be the first time that you're meeting this person. They might be uncomfortable. So it takes a little bit of time to open up, get them comfortable, and sometimes that requires space or silence after you've asked the question. Give them that space. Ask questions neutrally and don't suggest answers. When there is silence, oftentimes we want to immediately jump in, fill that silence and that space, and maybe ask the question a different way. And sometimes that could cause us to even ask a leading question. Give them that space. And if they don't understand, and they come back and they tell you they don't understand, then look for a different way to ask that question. But again, give them time to think about that answer and don't suggest answers. And we want to use unpacking questions. 
So let me talk a little bit about what unpacking questions are. Unpacking questions help us drill down and get to that root cause. So we've asked our initial questions and they've come back and they've given us that first answer. Follow up with that unpacking question like, oh, why do you say that? Or even just a why. Or tell me more about that. What were you thinking when you did that? Walk me through what led you to that decision. How did you feel about that? That helps us get beyond that first answer, that first response that they're giving us because, as I mentioned earlier, most likely that's not the really detailed answer that we want. We want to help drill down to that root cause. So those unpacking questions will help us with that. So those are some best practices in the empathy phase. And then when we get to the defined phase, this is where, again, we define our problem statements. And so you're defining a, a meaningful and an actionable problem statement based on what you've learned. So this is where you unpack your empathy. You use empathy to, to scope a meaningful problem need statement, and we're developing a point of view from that user. And so here there's a couple of tools that you can be using. We talked about this last time. You've got your four box tool, or you've got your how might we, where we're turning that problem statement into a how might we question so that we're reframing it. So it makes it more meaningful, helps us to drive that action. Now additionally, this is where we want to be using our learner personas. And a learner persona is after you have gone out and you and your team have interviewed, you have this idea of that role in your head, but you want to make sure that everybody is aligned with that idea. And so to do that, you can create a learner persona which represents that role or that general person. And as you'll see, we've got our four boxes that we've added in here, what they said, did, felt, thought, and you're just creating sort of that general example of that role. Here's another example of a learner persona that we've used before. And again, you've got your four boxes. There's not really a right or wrong way to create learner personas, but it's a great way to make sure that your team is aligned on what that user represents or what you feel that user represents, creating that point of view from that user. So a couple of uh, guiding principles within the defined phase from the problem statement perspective. So you want it to be broad enough, the problem statement, where there's some creative freedom. And it needs to be human-centered because remember, this is about that learner, that end user, that human. But you want your problem statement to be narrow enough to make it manageable. You don't want it to be so lofty that it encompasses the entire world. It's got to be actionable. So it needs to be narrow enough so you can make it meaningful. So here's an example of a problem statement. A problem statement tends to have uh, your user name or a bit of a description about them and identifies that they need a way to do something because of a specific insight. So you've got your user, they need to do blank because of a reason. And so here's an example that I've put together Let's say that you're, uh, you're helping call center representatives. And the call center representatives, their roles are at risk because of robotics and artificial intelligence. So they need to really think about um, how they can provide value. And so when you've gone out and you've learned about your call center agent, we've deciphered that information, we synthesized it, and the problem statement that we came up with is, a call center agent needs a way to use emotional intelligence with customers because these tasks are getting automated and the calls will be difficult and more complex and ambiguous and more difficult. So that has their user name, that has their verb, and it has their surprising insight. Now, that's a little bit of a complex problem statement and it's a lot of verbiage. So we can turn that problem statement into a how might we statement. And that how might we is, how might we help call center agents handle calls that are highly emotive, complex, ambiguous, and difficult? So this feels a little more actionable. And the how might we statement gives it a... We're not suggesting we have the answer, but we want to explore what is or what could that problem be and what could we define in our ideation phase as potential solutions. So how might we make it more actionable and meaningful? 
So once we have our how might we statements or how might we questions, we then move into the ideate phase. So a couple of best practices in the ideate phase. First of all, it's not about coming up with that right idea. It's about generating the broadest range of possibilities. And so in the first couple of phases, we really narrow in that focus, but in the IDA phase, we flare out and we go big and we think about as many ideas as we can come up with. So a couple of best practices, set a time limit in your brainstorming so that people understand what they're working towards. A lot of times we have so much fun and we get a bit carried away that time can get away from us. So set that time limit so we have something to work towards. Stay on topic. Uh, oftentimes, we will want to go on tangents or really start to solve all the problems in the world. So what I do is I put the how might we statements on the wall or how might we questions on the wall so that we are focused on what it is that we're actually trying to solve and that helps us stay on topic. Defer judgment or criticism with the ideas that you and your colleagues and your teams are coming up with. The word no does not exist. It should be yes and. We should be building on each other because the minute that you judge or you criticize somebody's idea, they're going to shut down. Ideation is a safe place for us to be playing in so that we can have these creative ideas, these wild and wacky ideas that maybe are not even feasible, they're not even realistic, but you know what? That's okay because real ideas can be born from those. And we want to encourage that and, again, defer judgment or criticism. I recommend including people outside of your initial team as part of these, the brainstorming activity. The value of that is if we are brainstorming with the people that we already work with, we're probably going to come up with the same ideas that we've always come up with. And we're going to have our conscious or our unconscious bias we bring with us that history, maybe about why this won't work, or that idea was tried before and it failed, or they'll never approve that. We don't have the budget for that. We don't want to hear any of that. And so if you bring in outside people who have nothing to do with this initiative, who have nothing to do maybe with that client or your business or your team, they're not going to have any of that baggage or that history, and they're going to potentially bring a lot of new ideas that you may not have thought of because you're putting constraints on your ideas based on history. So bring in outside people. Build on each other's ideas. As I mentioned, it's yes and. You want to be visual in your ideation. You want to draw on post-it notes, draw on white pieces of paper. Um, you can use whiteboards, but I tend to recommend not doing whiteboards because you want to keep these ideas and you want to be able to move them around and that's very difficult to do on a whiteboard. So that's why a lot of times you'll see in images about design thinking, people using post-it notes, because it's very easy to move those around and to group them together. And then try to have one conversation at a time. Again, as I mentioned, it's easy to get off topic. It's easy to have a lot of different ideas. So use a parking lot. Get a white piece of paper, and when these other conversations come up and you're starting to go off on tangents, put that idea in the parking lot so that you can come back to it later on. That way you can stay focused on that how might we question in front of you because that's what we're solving in the ideation phase is the how might we question. So here's a suggestion for a best practice for an ideation process that I tend to follow. And it's a four-step process. And the first is where we idea share. We brainstorm, we brain dump, and then we move into sketching and storyboarding out those ideas that we like. And then, sorry, hit the wrong button. And after we've sketched and storyboarded those ideas, then we present them back as a group. And we then vote on them. And then after we voted on those ideas, then we plot them on a prioritization matrix against impact and feasibility to figure out which ones are viable, which ones do we want to be moving forward with. And I'm going to be walking through this in a very detailed example when we get to the use case in a few minutes. But this is an idea for a four-step ideation process that gets you through that initial brain dump, that brain sharing, all the way through plotting them so that you can visually see what are the ideas we should be moving forward with to help solve that how might we question. So after our ideation,
phase, then we move into the prototype phase, and this is where we build one or more ideas off of our ideations that we have voted on. So some of you may have heard about an MVP or that concept of MVP, the minimum viable product. And that's the idea in your prototype phase. You want to build a prototype that has just enough features or functionalities for you and your end users or your customers to be able to provide feedback. So here's a quick example. Um, if you're thinking about transportation and you're trying to solve for transportation, you wouldn't be first uh, creating a tire and then maybe the, the frame and then putting that together to build a car because if you're doing that at each of these phases, you, can't, you don't actually have enough features to try out and solve that transportation issue. Whereas if you start with something like this where maybe you have a skateboard that can actually transport individuals, you learn about that, that has functionality because it's able to move from point A to point B, that then evolves to a scooter, again, has functions and features and evolves on until you get to that final phase of your product. So again, you want it to have just enough features and functionality. So some guiding principles in the prototype phase, just start building. Don't wait for approval, don't wait for funding. Prototyping is quick. Prototyping should be no cost or very, very, very low cost. You don't want to spend too much time or money to get prototypes created within a couple of days. So once we've learned about the how might we, the ideation, we've got our ideas, just start building. Because the design thinking project is quick. It really should not take more than two to three weeks from start to finish so that you're going out, you're learning from your end users, you're identifying the problem statements, you're ideating, you're creating those prototypes, and you're getting their input to identify a key prototype that you want to eventually move forward and create a product out of that. Remember what you're testing for in the prototype phase. Remember that how might we statement. Remember your end users and build with them in mind. And you could even keep them as part of this process, this initiative. I actually try and keep or involve some end users even in the brainstorming phase, the ideation phase, so that they can be a part of that. Because what better way to come up with ideas to solve their challenge than to bring them into that. There should be, uh, there's typically two types of prototypes. You have your low fidelity and your high fidelity quick or inexpensive, no cost, high fidelity tends to take a bit more time, could be three months, six months, and could be a bit costly. So we try to avoid high fidelity prototypes. Some examples of low fidelity prototypes, they can just be drawings. They could be a print off of your mobile device or your iPhone screen if it's an app you're trying to create. These are actual examples of low fidelity prototypes we've created. And then for high fidelity prototypes, they're a bit more, again, costly, time-consuming. This was one that we created about an app, but it took about three to six months to create that, and that's too long for uh, a prototype in your design thinking phase. So once you've got your prototype, then you want to move on to testing, and this is where you're going out and you're getting those user feedback. And in the test phase, you prototype as if you know you're right, but then you test as if you know you're wrong. You want to have those authentic experiences for your users to test out your prototypes in there as possible, where you're really testing and you're refining your point of view. You're learning about this. And I'll share with you that oftentimes, the prototypes that we came up with, out of the gate, they fail. They don't pass the test, or our users don't like them, or they're not the right solution. And that's the whole point of design thinking. That's why it's quick and it's iterative, so we can fail fast forward and learn from it so that we can get to that right prototype that does solve the problem. So some best practices, let your, let your user experience the prototype in their environment. Have them talk through that experience. You want to actively observe them. You don't want to be correcting your user. If they're using it wrong, that's what you want to observe, but don't correct them. 
and watch again how they use or misuse your prototype and then of course follow up with questions about their experience so that you can learn from it and then be creating prototypes that do solve for their challenges. So I know that's a lot of information, but let's stop here for a quick Q&A before we move on to our use case. Okay, yep. So if you have a question then, or if you've got an area that Keith's covered that you want him to expand on, please put it in the Q&A section, which is on the right-hand side of WebEx. And just a quick reminder, because a few of you have asked, the slides and the recording will be sent to you. We can go back to it when you get that PowerPoint. Okay, so we've got a few questions coming in. First one, Key, who should be a part of the empathy interview process? Mm, good question. Um, so, first of all, the pe when I am running initiatives, more likely than not, I am the only person with experience. And that's okay. Uh, I like to have the customers involved and um, then I'll have my team involved as well. So usually what I do is I'll pair up um, into twos because you want to have an interviewer and a note taker. And I will try to get somebody who's more experienced to be the interviewer. And then sometimes I will try and have the customer um, or whomever I'm working with, the business unit, my business partner, be the note taker so that they can hear firsthand some of the challenges that our end users are facing. Um, so the short answer is it's okay to not have people who are experienced. That's the whole purpose of that pre-work that we do before we actually go out to that empathy phase is to get everybody upskilled um, with how to conduct empathy interviews. And then even before that, I'll usually conduct a one or two hour kickoff about what design thinking is, the value of it, how it works, um, et cetera. Okay, great. I think just because of time, we'll ask just one more in this Q&A section. Um, so the next one is, in your experience, which operational areas within companies tend to invest in design thinking? And have you noticed this change over the last couple of years? That's a good question. Um, what I like about the evolution of design thinking is that it has historically been very product driven. So that's you know, you have IDEO, you have Apple, you have uh, Stanford D School at Stanford University. They focus more on it from a product side. I focus more on processes and the service side. And so to answer the question, I think historically, you know, being more product driven, that was in, in industries where the focus was. Now that there are use cases of it being applied elsewhere, other groups are open. So where I focus on it and where I'm hearing uh, companies focus on it more now be interested is from a learning or human capital space. Whether it be learning, whether it be recruiting, that's, those are, tend to be more of the organizations or business units that I see the growth opportunity in within organizations. Yeah, we've got some more questions, but I think if we look at them at the next Q&A section. Perfect. All right, so let's jump into the design thinking initiative and the use case. So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, in 2018, the team that I was working with was receiving consistent positive feedback from their learners. They're using level one surveys, they're having conversations, and everything that they heard, that we heard, was good. And we had initiatives going on that really showed business positive results from a learning perspective. So on the surface, the team felt that they were performing successfully and that the learners were satisfied with the training. But that's not often enough, especially level ones, because what we were hearing is that the training in front of them was good. But we weren't asking if there was something else that was missing. And so the question the team had was, yeah, everything seems to be going well, but could we be doing better? Is there a way that we could be improving the learner experience so that we could be driving performance and business impact even more? And so the reason I share this with you is because oftentimes design thinking initiatives don't start with a specific problem. That's 
in phase two, where we're defining our problem statement, it can start with an idea or an ambiguous question that you're wanting to uncover. And so in this case, the question for us was, can we improve our learner experience for our learners? And so that was the concept that we went forward with. So I, got, I gathered a team. Uh, question. And throughout the presentation. was five from my company and five from the client's company. And the five people from our client had no experience with design thinking. So the first thing was to give them a quick session on what design thinking is, tell them the value of it. Um, then it was to identify where we wanted to focus on. And so in part of the empathy phase, before we went out to the actual, and this is an automotive client, so before we went out to the actual dealerships, uh, we needed to identify who we wanted to meet with. And so we did a little bit of data analysis on the size of dealers, uh, their new hires, the success rate that they had. And then from there, we identified dealerships and we broke up into groups of two and decided that we would hit on different regions. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to spend several days prepping for the empathy interviews. And this would include, as I mentioned, brainstorming questions, themes throughout the session, and if we don't mock interviews. In fact, what you'll see here, this was actually our mock interview practice guide that we came up with. And once we had come up with these questions, then the next uh, activity was for these two these teams to go out into the organization and just ask people, hey, do you have a few minutes? We'd like to understand how you learn because everyone learns. So these questions were relevant to anybody that we talked with. So we went out and we had a couple of hours of practice sessions and we learned a lot from this. We then refined those questions and then turned them into new questions that we would actually be asking during the interview. And so we went out to the uh, five, five uh, regions and we conducted 75 interviews across the US. At the end of each interview day, we would use some of the tools that I mentioned earlier, the four boxes, and we would create empathy maps. Of this event will be emailed to you. So these are some examples of some of the notes that we had taken uh, from our interviews. And then after the interview, so the interviews were about a week long, we uh, then came back together at their headquarters and we started to really synthesize the data and move into the defined phase where we define the problem statements. And so here's an example of the four boxes that we use, and this is where we identify key quotes. Um, we identify what motivates that learner. And so this helps us to create our learner or user personas. And here's just a quick snapshot of a high level of our four roles and our user personas. And as I mentioned earlier, the value from this is that it helps us identify and get aligned on our personas or what represents these individual users. And so here's an example of our data synthesis. And from this point, we were just kind of putting down ideas, what we heard, what were some themes, what did we learn? And we can use this information later to create uh, themes for our uh, feedback. And so from that information, we then created six and identified six key themes from our learners. So what we learned is that, yes, the training that they were receiving was good, but there is a whole area that they need us to focus on, and that's soft skills. They needed help with reading people, listening, sell skills. They needed inspiration and motivation. They felt that the training was a bit boring and they wanted to move away from this concept of web-based. They want the training to be personalized to their needs so that it's based on their experience and their interest level. They want flexibility to learn. They want hands-on and interactive learning. And they felt that time spent training was time away from selling. So they weren't really recognizing the value of training. So we took these six themes and we identified two that we wanted to focus on, the hands-on and interactive, and the time training is time away from selling. So we took those problem statements. For example, the first problem statement was, I need to learn from experience so I can apply it as I learned. And we turned it into how might we statements. How might we give learners experiential ways to learn on their own? 
How might we enable people to learn from others on their job? Then we took the second problem statement, time training is time away from selling, and we turned it into how might we change the perception of what training means? Because this means to us that they don't recognize the value of training. Training to them is not something that's valuable, but also how might we provide training that doesn't take them away from their job? How might we give them that just-in-time performance support? So now we have our how might we questions. So we put those on the wall. We brought in other individuals to participate in our ideation session. And so as I mentioned earlier, there's four phases that we use. And so this is some of our brain dumps. So we just got together and we started brain dumping. We brought in a couple of users that we interviewed. We brought in some outside people that weren't part of this initiative, weren't part of the business unit, and just started brainstorming. So after we had our initial brain dump, we broke up into groups and we built on those initial ideas. And we started sketching and storyboarding out ideas uh, into a greater detail so that we could tell stories behind them and so they had individual components or functions within those stories. So after we storyboard and sketch those ideas, then we came back together as a group and we presented those stories and we recorded this so that we could continue to review it. And this took about, I would say, a half a day just for the sketching and storyboarding and presenting it back to the teams because then the next step is to vote. And so we voted on three categories. What idea is doable? What idea is a wild card? Meaning we have no idea if it's even possible, but we really like this idea. We want to explore it more. And what idea is disruptive? Could be a positive disruption or a negative disruption, but the concept itself is disruptive. So we voted on these. We tallied up the votes. And then from there, we identified and plotted these votes against a prioritization matrix. And so as I mentioned earlier, the prioritization matrix is based on impact and feasibility. So we broke it up into four quadrants. What are our big bets? What are our stars? It's kind of that risk reward sweet spot where we think these have the best um, value that we can bring as a result for the problem statements and our lower priorities and our quick hits. So we plotted them against those and we identified three stars and we wanted to move forward with those stars. So the first was this concept of sell like we do, where we encourage mentorship, we encourage partnering, um, where we create this almost a social network so that it allows them to work and learn from each other because the how might we question was how might we give learners experiential ways to learn on their own. The next idea was this concept of mobile molly where we're able to deliver content whether it's push or pull to their mobile device where it acts like a digital mentor maybe asking questions or answering questions and really serving up relevant content. Good evening, wherever in the world you are. We create um, a video feedback portal or a virtual training opportunity because everybody loved the trainers, but trainers are expensive and there's a finite number of them. So we wanted to create this opportunity where they could have virtual trainers available. So these were our three star ideas that we came up through the brainstorming phase. So then we move into the prototype phase. And we took those three ideas and then we built on them. So the first one was the sell like we do, which is the social component, and we came up with a free idea that took virtually no time, and it was a closed group for our new hires so that they could have this environment where they could learn from each other. So this is a great example of a prototype because it's free and it was quick and we have control over it and we were able to start it immediately and get some feedback. The next was the concept of Mobile Molly, which essentially is a chatbot. And so one best practice is leverage vendors. Vendors often will create prototypes, or they use the term pilot, for you for free. And so we leveraged a vendor, our partner, and we were able to create a quick, free chatbot prototype that we could begin using immediately. And the third was video events, or again, that concept of virtual feedback and coaching. And from here again, we leveraged our vendors and we were able to come up with a quick tool that allows us to have a virtual coaching 
uh, platform that we could prototype. So then we've got our three prototypes, and I'm going to go through and talk about one of them in more detail, and that was the Mobile Molly. And so this is a chatbot prototype. And so what we did is we created two tracks for a chatbot. One track was providing texts on a daily basis for two weeks, and the other was detailed design thinking three times a week over four weeks. What we learned was that after the ninth chat, we got a big drop off. And so that tells us that we had about a 74% engagement through the first nine chats. So now we know that nine days is really the, the sweet spot for an engagement level for a, the person on the other end of that. We also learned that our participants do not want chats on the weekend or after hours, which was a very important distinction for us to learn. We also got a net pr promoter score of 69, which was great since usually at that a 50 is, is targets good. And again, no Sunday texts. So what we observed through this is that our sales consultants, those who used it and engaged with it, really liked this concept. Um, we needed to have product trainers really influence the participation rates. For us, change management is an issue. We couldn't just send out an email and say, hey, here's a prototype once you participate with. We had to have champions. A more shorter, intense cycle was preferred from a chatbot perspective. Uh, we identified only provide chats during working hours and never on weekends. And we used quizzes both pre and post to help us identify, did the chatbot actually help reinforce and refresh knowledge and increase retention? And the results were yes, those ideas, and then of course we test those ideas to increase retention and reinforce that knowledge. So we've used this information from this uh, design thinking initiative to really help set our next three-year journey because what we uncovered was, as I mentioned, they need help in other areas, which we had no idea. So that's helped us reframe our three-year future learning journey. So a number of lessons learned. First of all, design thinking is not a solution for every problem. Um, so we don't want to have design thinking-itis, but specifically in L&D, we narrow design thinking. If the problem is human-centered, it's ambiguous, user experience. With your team, and maybe you're not certain what the problem is or you need to drill down to that root cause, that could be a good use case for design thinking. Remember that empathy and customer interviews them in more detail with a lot of, you want to have dedicated resources for your initiatives. That was one of the challenges that we had is that we didn't have a dedicated project manager or leader to lead us through. And so when you don't have dedicated resources, sometimes your projects and your initiatives could take longer. Um, I will also share with you that the prototype, and just an example of prototypes not working, because they don't often work, the prototype that we did for the virtual coaching tool failed miserably. Because what we learned is our learners in this environment do not want to download any more apps. And that was the beauty of the chatbot, is there's nothing to download. It connects directly to your SMS. And that's why that prototype was much more successful versus our other prototype where we learned that end users don't want to be downloading any apps on their devices. Uh, again, avoid yes or no questions. Think about that bias and that negative voice as you're conducting your interviews. Remember you're there to understand, not to validate. Remember that design thinking initiatives are quick and they're iterative, should take maybe about three weeks on average. And again, make sure that you take notes on the experience of your interviews. And lastly, there are some additional resources we're going to be sharing in the chat. They'll also be available to you. Uh, we've got a resource page at GP that will house um, some content that we've created from webinars, from infographs, blogs, white papers. I've also got some design thinking success stories. Uh, it's very helpful for you to have knowledge and awareness of success stories as you're helping customers, clients, or maybe your own business group learn the concept of design thinking. Success stories will help you understand new ways that you could be applying design thinking. And lastly, IBM offers a free online MOOC. 
So you can take that course online. Uh, it's a really great tool to help you learn more about design thinking if you're looking for a more structured training perspective. So with that, I think we may have time for one question and then I can follow up in an email or a blog with any additional questions that um, anyone may have. Additionally, real quick, please do add me on LinkedIn. I'd love to continue this conversation with you on LinkedIn. I do post uh, blogs, do share more discussions and articles there. So again, connect with me there and let's continue this conversation. So Danielle, any questions? Uh, yeah, we'll try and squeeze in one, and then as Kay said, um, any of us that we haven't managed to get to, we will um, address in a follow-up email, so we will address all of your questions. Um, so just quickly then, at the Empathize stage, in addition to interviews, are there any other approaches that you have used? Uh, yes. So empathy can consist of customer surveys. Um, I have been a part of some groups that do like to do more focus groups. Um, so customer surveys, focus groups, and individual one-on-one -on -one interviews. Those individual one-on-one -on -one are is the recommendation that I have to really get to that that root cause analysis, to really get to the heart of what uh, your learners and your end users are trying to tell us. But those are two other options. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, as we said, we'll address all of your questions that we haven't managed to get round to in a follow-up email. Um, but yeah, that is um, time on today's session, so we'll go ahead and start wrapping things up. Uh, thank you, Keith, for the presentation today, um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today and last week. We hope that you found the session, the series, sorry, um, helpful, useful, and interesting. Um, there are Keith's contact details if you want to email him outside of this webinar and address anything that you want to explore with him further. And just to remind you again that these slides and a copy of the recording will be sent to the email address that you registered with. So please allow 24 hours for this to be actioned. And you can also find it on our webinar recording page at gp-ltd.com. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Keith, and have a great day.